my name is Gaurav. Uh, I work at Cadence. I'm an application engineer uh, and I support Legos and Beauty Product Line, which is basically road and simulation. What, uh, I, I work with Cameron, I report to Cameron, uh, and what we're going to talk about today is uh, I'm going to give you an overview of what in design uh, analysis and checking flow are. Uh, we've have we've had a complaint from our users over the last few years that when it comes to PCB designers, if we could give some power into PCB designers' hands, that they could do some first base analysis, let's say while you're designing a layout, if you could check what the impedance is for the whole board, if you can, if you could check what the coupling and cross talks is, uh, if, you, if you could check uh, what is the voltage drop or current drop across the board is within the Allegro layout uh, interface. You don't have to learn a simulation tool, you don't have to learn an analysis tool, and you could do that without waiting for your SI engineer, PI engineer to come back to you with that information. So that's the, that's the basis uh, for this technology, and that's why we developed it last year. So it's basically a new uh, environment which is, which is blending Allegro and Sigrity technology together. Sigrity is a cadence product which is used for signal and power integrity analysis and simulation. So uh, within the Allegro framework, we're bringing these two technologies together for, uh, to, to do calculations like impedance calculation and uh, coupling and uh, roster calculations and many others. We're adding new workflows to this technology <coughs> as we speak right now uh, with our new 17.4 uh, release coming out later this summer. It's going to be more workflows, more user, uh, user uh, functionalities available in the Allegro framework. Uh, it's like, like I said, it's again powered by a security technology. It has analysis flows and checking flow, and we're going to talk more about that uh, moving on. So the analysis flow is something that, that doesn't require any constraint manager setup. I know you guys are familiar with setting of constraints. Uh, different set of constraints, but there are two flows. Analysis flow does not need you to set up constraints. Analysis flow just need you to define what nets you want to simulate. So for example, you have some DDR buses in your design, and you want to see what the impedance is for those DDR, DDR buses. You choose those buses, and you run the simulation. And it takes a couple of minutes to run the simulation and tells you if there is any impedance mismatch somewhere that you want to take care of before you see any further uh, advanced issues. So that's the analysis workflow. The checking workflow, is something that requires rules. So in the checking workflow, you set up some constraints, and then you, using those constraints, you see DRCs on your design, which your guys are already familiar with. So checking workflow gives you uh, some uh, hold over the setting of the rules, and then it gives you analysis based on those set rules after you run uh, the, the analyze button. And it basically helps you f uh, focus on finding violations and some uh, trace issues in the design. Is it, is, it, is it something that you guys would be interested in? Does it make sense? Okay. All right, so the implementation is done for analysis workflow. There's a dockable window. Like I said, there's a dockable window in the, uh, in the analysis workflow. You, the only thing you have to do is select nets that you want to simulate, and that's it. And you have to run the simulation, and, and it'll give you some, some type of results. There, is, there, is, there, there are different, side, uh, different kind of visions provided. The dynamic range you see on the right is, is called what we call vision view of the design. And this vision view gives you, for example, the blue would be something that has low impedance, and the red would be something that has ba uh, high impedance. Red always doesn't mean it's bad. It's just you have to look at the values as well as the color together to see if something you need to change something in, in the design to make it uh, go to the fabrication. There are document tables and windows in the design. So for all, for all the traces in the design that you, you have simulated now, all, all these traces are highlighted in the, in the, doc, uh, in the document tables. And you can see each, for each of those nets that, you, that you're simulating, what values of impedance and coupling and all those parameters are uh, in the window. In the checking flow, there, is a, there are DRCs. You can check DRCs, and you can use the existing constraint manager work, worksheet to, uh, you, uh, to use the checking flow. And it gives you another functionality which we call DRC vision. DRC vision basically, it shows you, it, it gives you a different way to see constraints. Instead of DRC markers, it'll show you something in colored form to see what, what is working okay, uh, what is not okay, in terms of colors basically, just not DRC uh, markers. So that's, that's all I had from the presentation view. Uh, I'll just show you a small demo how, how this works in, in, real, in real life. So this, I'm using a Venture PCB license, if you guys are familiar with Cadence products. Mm -hmm. All right, there you go. 
So I'm using Venture PCB license uh, to do this simulation. Uh, the first thing, like I said, is gonna be to invoke the workflows. Uh, you go to Analyze and you go to Workflow Manager. This is the workflow manager basically, and it gives you access to six different workflows right now at present with Cadence Technology. The Impedance workflow is going to tell you what uh, uh, what impedances are for, for the nets you want to simulate. Crosstalk and coupling workflow will give you how much noise coupling is going on between different nets, even differential pairs. A return path workflow will tell you if there is any ground bounce issue. Ground bounce basically if there are any return path discontinuities in the design that you want to ch uh, check on and fix. Reflection workflow will basically tell you uh, if there is an intersimple interference going on in the design. If, they, if, the, if there are any impedance discontinuities in the design that's causing the ringing in the, in the voltage curves that we see all the time. IR drop workflow is the major strength of this and we, we're still developing it. It's out there right now. Uh, it basically gives you major functionality from Power DC. Power DC is a product of security product line. Power DC does uh, IR drop analysis for you, current and voltage, and we have made that technology available in Allegro so that PCB designers doesn't have to go and learn Power DC as a different tool. So you can do some preliminary, uh, some first based uh, tests for, to see how the current and voltage distribution is across the whole board. So, uh, for this demo, I'm just going to show you what you, how impedance workflow works. The only setting, like I said, is going to be net based. Uh, only, uh, the only setting I need is net selection. So I'm gonna, these are all the nets in the design. There are about 291 nets. I'm sure you guys have seen that before. Uh, I'm just going to filter out to some uh, some of the nets, and I'm going to use those nets to simulate. So I've chosen all the DDR nets in the design. Some of the DDR nets in the design. There are like 98 nets selected, and I hit OK, and I hit Start Analysis. So what this analysis is going to do for me, it's going to calculate the single ended imp impedance and the differential impedance for the di differential lines in the design for the nets that I've selected. And it's gonna show you in a colored fashion what the impedance is overall. And it takes about a couple of, not even a couple of minutes to do it. It's actually done. So if I go to my impedance vision, that's the vision I was talking about. It's, it is only highlighting the nets that are chosen for the simulation. It's highlighting them, some, most of them in blue, which is pretty good, around 40 ohms. That's the dynamic range. Some of them are in green, which is around the 50 ohm mark, and a few of these nets are around 60 ohms, 69 ohms, if I see the uh, dynamic range. So you want to, now it's up to you, you want to see if, if it's bad for your design or not. Mostly, as a rule of thumb, we see single-ended impedance should be closer to 50 ohms. So that's why I, I would focus on one of the nets, which is high impedance, and uh, <coughs> see if I could fix, if I, if I could find an error, why is it 69, 69 ohms? To do that, to narrow down to one of those uh, design, uh, one of those nets in red, I go to impedance table. This is a table that is highlighting me, for me all the different nets that are simulated with all different values that, that uh, the impedance workflow gives you. And for each of these nets, this is the length of that net that net goes through from start to end. There are different segments that net is consisting of. So if you click on one of the nets, it takes you through the whole path of that net and you can figure out where the impedance is high or low. So I'm gonna, and it gives you filtering options, which is the major strength of this workflow with the, uh, with the dockable, dockable window. So I'm gonna uh, sort it out for maximum impedance, and this is a net that has maximum impedance, and for this net, I'm gonna see at what length it has that kind of impedance. So I'm gonna sort this out as well, and then if I double click, let me zoom, uh, take it, okay. And if I double click on this segment, it's going to cross prop to that very location where that impedance is high. If I do this, it takes me to that location where the impedance is high. And uh, why the impedance is high is the next step. If I hover over this net, I see the H is on layer 4 signal 2. I see the upper reference is on layer 2 ground, and I know the lower reference is on layer 7. But if, as a designer, if I'm a designer, I created this board, I go back to my visibility pane and I, sh I see on layer five, there's a ground, but it's not referenced to that. Why is that? If I enable layer five now and come back and disable the vision, you see why the impedance was higher there? Because there is a void there. So there's no return path for the return to current to flow. That's the return path discontinuity that's causing the impedance to go high. So that's the, basically the power of this, this product. That's the power of this technology for you to do it at your desk without talking to your without, uh, I mean, you're free to talk to your SI engineer, but without waiting for them to come back to you, 
over uh, after you send this board out to them. That 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 time gap it bridges that time gap and makes you design the product faster. Another uh, th this was analysis workflow basically. Uh, I think I have two more minutes. Let me show you another another uh, workflow, which is a checking workflow. So it's the same design. I, I just refreshed my my circuit. And if I go to view, I vision manager, and I choose impedance DRC vision. This is basically this is an alternative way to see DRCs in the design. You guys are familiar with seeing DRCs as white white markers, and you go to them, you uh, you find each of them and fix them for whatever reason they are there. But in this case, I'm gonna just select the design. All these nets. The nets in green are good to go. That means the green meets constraint value. There is a constraint set up behind this. Green meets constraint value. Uh, blue is smaller than the constraint, which is also good. But the nets in red have greater than the constraint value that you have set in the constraint manager. So you 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 are used to do, seeing DRC markers by working with uh, when you work with constraint manager. This is just an alternative ap approach how to see DRCs uh, in, in in a colored form, in a vision form. I guess that was my time. If you have any questions, I'll be at, at the back, and I just want to give Doug to uh, come over here and or or Bob. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give Cadence another round of applause for uh, hosting us and sponsoring the event. So now we get to the main presentation. Um, I want to just a couple of quick highlights. Uh, Mr. Smith here has a BS, a B dub. Oh, no, you're not going to read the whole thing. No, just two okay. two items: the B triple E degree from Vanderbilt, and an MSEE degree from California Institute of Technology. And he's also the author of High Frequency Measurements and Noise in Electronic Circuit. Please welcome Doug Smith. Thank you. <laughs> I used to live here in the Bay Area and then went for a visit. We, my wife and I went to see a show up in Vegas. We went over to Boulder City to visit someone there that I knew from the rebound committees and things together. We never left. Boulder City is like the Hotel California. You can check out, but you can't leave. <laughs> and so now we're over there. And uh, listening to the last presentation brought back some memories. My first simulation program was done on a deck of IBM cards. That included the program and my data into it. <laughs> And the computer was the size of this room. Mm -hmm. Then a few years later, uh, I did a simulation of a, uh, it was the first chip that had defined cells that you could place on a chip. Uh, that was the, the very first one of those did that. And then that was at Bell Labs. And then a few years later, a bus structure uh, that I simulated. And for that, the simulation ran on a Cray computer up at Murray Hill in Bell Labs. This is like 1985 or so, 88. And each run of the simulation completely tied up the Cray computer. The main computer fell out for 20 minutes and billed our department $600 for each run of the simulation. So I had to make sure I wasn't making errors and getting bad days in the simulation. So things have changed a lot. That's like the steam engineer. <laughs> but uh, so I, I just think about wow, things really changed since then. Usually by the time I get involved in a problem, uh, oh, let me, one more thing. Uh, I work, I, so I worked at Bell Labs and took an early retirement from there and moved out to the valley here. Work for, uh, anyone remember Auspec Systems? They made high performance servers back in the late 90s. <coughs> yeah, they're long gone. Um, I remember, by the way, their service cost like a half million dollars. And I remember the celebration we had when we, we did cross one terabyte of storage, <laughs> which is now like a little thing like this for 50 bucks a prize. You know? <laughs> Maybe that's why they're not in business. So, um, so uh, in 2001, uh, I did what I was planning on doing for years, and that's quit and go independent. I have only one boss now. She's back home in Boulder City. <laughs> Sometimes life is easier with one boss than two. Uh, but uh, uh, so I've been uh, independent now, and I help clients. And usually by the time I get involved, they've usually pretty much checked out circuit boards. It's often, although it can be the circuit board, it's often the way the circuit board interfaces with the rest of the system, like how it's mounted in the chassis, how close to the chassis, how many points, if any, to the chassis are connected, and things like that cause all kinds of problems, and, uh, and I get involved with that. <coughs> but what this talk is, <coughs> a 
couple years ago, I ran into something quite new. And uh, uh, so I wrote a little talk on it. And some elements of this, I, I gave a design comment earlier this year, and they got some more stuff here, and a little demo that we're going to do in a few minutes. Uh, by the way, after the talk, feel free to come up and poke at the demo yourself. Uh, and uh, the, I have a, a video of it, but since we actually have it, we don't need to do that. So we test circuit boards, systems, sometimes even devices, individual devices, for ESD. And typically, we give them a few big hits. Like at the system level, it could be 10 hits for each polarity and each voltage. And so maybe a few hundred hits all around the system uh, of big ones. And we see if it fails, it doesn't fail great. But I ran into a situation two years ago, which got me thinking. And the situation was, it was a printer of labels, uh, similar like maybe Amazon might use in a warehouse, or uh, any of the warehouse, or maybe shipping labels or something like that. And it was supposed to have a life of five years in the field, the printhead. But it was failing after three months. Pixels would start to go bad after three months. <coughs> and uh, they weren't quite sure what was causing it. I thought it might be ESD, but I wasn't quite sure what that would be. Uh, it wouldn't be big hits because it would have failed much earlier than that, maybe even in, in testing. And uh, so that spurred this talk. And so the little ESD event, every time you touch something, you get an event. You just can't feel it. Uh, you don't get to feel it till it's, well, by 2,000 volts, some people can feel it. By 3,000, everyone can feel it. It's a little tiny event. But I touch something, and you get a 50 volt event, or a 100 volt, or 500. You can't feel it every time you touch something. Or if you have a system with moving parts, they generate their own. Every time two conductors meet, there's some little discharge. Even if I have protection uh, on the board for the chip, there's some little vestige of that zap that gets into the chip, either because the layout wasn't that great and there's too much inductance in series with the protector, or um, my favorite one is where, they pr where the ESD or lightning, whatever the protector is, is returned to a different ground than the signal ground of the board, because all the chip knows is there's something voltage between the signal and its ground kit. And if you return to protector somewhere else, then that has some inductance, and that will increase the stress on the chip. And over time, that can cause problems. <coughs> so things that might have this happen to them, if you have a port that's used a lot, like USB, we're always plugging things in USB ports. And now we even have USB devices that have no shield, you have the metal shield around it. Um, SanDisk and others now, make uh, a little memory device. It's got SD pins on one side for your camera and USB pins on the other. And it's this little thing, it's not, there's no shield on it. And because there's no shield, even though the ground pin sticks out a little further, you're not guided in by the shield, nor discharge. So you might, depending on how you get in, you might get one of the USB pins to hit first. And then there goes, up over time, there goes the USB. Sometimes it burns out quick, actually. Anything with physical movement, I was with a medical company this morning, and uh, I, I do a lot of medical stuff. Um, they have some of them have moving parts in them, and they generate their own problems. Uh, as do printers. We'll use a printer example here. Uh, even if you have protection devices, again, some little vestige gets through, and again, protect it to a different ground. Um, how many people have seen my website? Just a few. Let me just real quick show you, because there's a lot of extra stuff there that you might want to read. It's full of like 300, here's, there it is. It's not a fancy website. You know, I should be doing this. Um, get it down to the papers and things. That's a race I was in. You know, it's the only non-technical thing website. But if you keep going down, now here, here's the published papers. And then here's what I call technical, tip, short technical articles. And there's hundreds of them. I keep writing more and more. Uh, lots of them. Uh, if you, if you have insomnia some night, just go start reading some of these articles. You'll be sleeping in no time. But, uh, uh, and there's probably an article on everything you can imagine in here. And they're all designed to be read in like five minutes or something. Uh, there's an article in there on returning to ports to different grounds. I think uh, PCB protection be, can be compromised by ground structure. I think it's a 2009 paper uh, covers that. And, uh, well, let me just real quick show you that since 
to give you an example of what you might find. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. Oh, it decided my thing timed out there. I need to use a little bit of password. Oh well, so much for that. <laughs> Won't bother with that now. But uh, there's a bunch of IEEE symposium papers in there too near the top. The public papers near the top. <coughs> so here's the field example. So this printer, after about three months, it was great for three months, and then slowly the pixels start to go bad in the print heads. And so should have been several years, it was a few months. And they were not quite sure what's happened when they came to me, what was happening. Yeah, I've never had a case where he, usually ESE just kills it or it doesn't kill it. That's what it's always been in the past. I thought, gee, I want to you could get some like accumulating damage or something. Why would it wait three months in the field before? And they would all, about three months, they'd all start going bad about the same time. Uh, and so it didn't have the right signature as being a big event causing it. Because that would be sort of random all over. <coughs> so I just I actually ended up measuring the event. What was happening is, and I'm probably getting ahead of the slides here, but the print media, the role of labels, was ESD dissipated, meaning slightly conductive. But they it was not connected to I don't want to say the word ground. It wasn't connected to the chassis of the printer. So as it's printing, it's developing a charge and it was sending micro lightning into the head. But not enough to damage it right away. So I measured the waveform, I'll show you how I did that. And I built a simulator to produce the waveform. And then I let it run for three hours at one pulse per second into the printhead. And sure enough, after 10,000 pulses, the, print, the pixel started to fail. <coughs> it took 10,000 hits to do it, to get the same. And then it, had to, it failed with the same signature as what's happening in the field. And charging of the print media. <coughs> and, and the fix was to, uh, was to the, this, I get the fun part of all the jobs. The fix is just ground the media, so I can't do that, right? They were buying the printhead, they don't control the printhead. That's the best part of what I do now. I, I get the fun part of the job, and then the people at the company are stuck with the, the hard part, what to do now. We know, we know what's causing it now. You know, I've ever had a board that was having a problem in the field for a company, and in fact, in one case, it was unbelievably simple. Uh, there was a place for a bypass capacitor that wasn't populated. And when we populated it, it fixed the problem. <laughs> And I had to test it, narrow down on that was why that was the problem. But when we found it, we put it, fixed the problem. But what about the year's production in the field? <laughs> that, so the, the, the people back to the company, which I used to be when I was at a company, had the problem. I, I get the fun part. That's the best part of what I do now, the fun part. So there's the print media, and there's a little ESD meter like you might find down in an in assembly area. People run around with these things looking for charge. Uh, and there's quite a bit of voltage on the media, and it's there because I charge it up uh, with, a, with a high voltage source, and it just loves to just sit there with that. So the way I characterize the event is I used a Keytech Mini Zap, which is the only ESD gun that you can charge with something without having to zap it. It's basically a high voltage power supply. So I'm charged up, and I'm holding the media, and I drop it onto that little target there without my, just drop it onto it to see how much charge that media had. And that was a measured waveform about 60 milliamps, even, well, to give you a feeling, um, typical ESD testing for European norms might be uh, 12 amps peak. This is 60 milliamps, tiny, tiny little event. And the time scale, fairly short, maybe 20, 30 nanoseconds, because it's a small thing. And there was another one that was about 200 milliamps. But again, teeny tiny compared to what we would normally do. So I built up a little simulator to do that. Simulator sort of off to the right. It was a pile of components sitting on the, on the table. And then it came in through a current probe. And, uh, and then a 200K resistor to get the current down to that kind of number. And, uh, and then it just sat against the printhead, pulsing away. I chose one pulse per second, as opposed to, say, 10. Because if I get too frequent, I'll get heating effects that wouldn't be natural. Wouldn't have time for the heat to dissipate between them. Uh, so I picked once per second, let it run for three hours, and uh, so I take an EFT like pulse, an electrical fast transient pulse. That's one of these European norms that we have to meet. <coughs> it simulates uh, high voltage pulses coming on the power line from sparking contacts, and 
it's characteristic is it has a fast rise time and a very slow fall with no overshoot. And uh, th that's exactly what these waveforms look like, by the way. That looks like an EFT waveform, except as it comes down the power line, there's maybe 10,000 of them at once. It looks a lot like an EFT pulse. That's why, that's why I wanted to furnish this, but through a higher impedance. It's a modified version of something I use for ESD troubleshooting. Uh, and much lower amplitude. Uh, the pulsar I use, which is actually a little one over there on the table there, um, it'll produce several amperes, but I have to cut it down with a resistor to uh, get it down. This is what the waveform looked like. There's a current probe, just a little loop on the end of the pulsar, <coughs> and it produced that waveform. That's, it's hard to read the, the divisions there, but it's eight amps peak and, and four or five nanoseconds rise time, which is much more than I would normally like to see. Uh, so I, and the, in the original version, that 200k resistor just cut things down, so I get a uh, I get tens of milliamps or maybe 100 milliamps kind of current. And there, there was the measurement set up. I've got a different version of it over here, which has a different use, which we're going to do in a minute, uh, as, a, as a, uh, uh, a way of troubleshooting boards. Um, just to say something like that one time I had done a seminar in Taiwan, and after the next day it was they wanted me to look at some things. <clears throat> and they had a new motherboard that had a problem, and they were they had like two hours for looking at it. Two hours is not even enough time to look over the documentation for a, a motherboard. Right? There's so many things that could go on there. So I basically took a little wire loop. We made one in it, sort of like that. Uh, fed a pulse from a, from a, an EFT generator. That's the actual standard just big thing, at least 50 pounds, uh, and. <coughs> scanned the board, and sure enough, we got to a spot in the board where we could produce the same symptom. And so, it's sort of, it's a similar circuit that I use for that uh, damage thing, but uh, modified somewhat, and maybe more powerful. Uh, anyway, it took like five minutes to find the problem. And what had happened was, they had an edge-triggered lead, and it went across to break in the planes, which wasn't even supposed to be there. It just sort of crept into the design somehow. Maybe someone sneezed when they're holding their mouth, you know, there's a break in the ground plane or something. Uh, and uh, narrowed it down, five minutes we found it. We were scanning the board, bing, we get the same symptom right away. And uh, uh, it's a great way of finding problems. Board. That board over there, which is a little microprocessor development board for testing your firmware, uh, uh, has a, a problem which is easily found this way. That was the target I used to measure the current. Uh, I probably should show you this other thing I have with me. The real reason I built that target wasn't for this. I used it for this, but the real reason was to calibrate a gadget, or, or to measure, I should say, the gadget that I have with me. I'll show it to you if you want. I'll demonstrate it. It might take out the projector, though. <laughs> uh, just on the side here, the state of Nevada has its own EMC little organization. And they require you, if you want to sell a casino machine in Nevada, it's got to pass this test which is basically a Tesla coil that puts out 30 amp pulses. Uh, maybe 20, 30, 20, 30 nanoseconds wide, 30 amp peak, maybe 10,000 on the second. It, it throws a spark that one, 50,000. And you gotta go all over your gambling equipment and prove that it's not affected by it. Because out there we get on purpose ESD, right? It's not accidental, it's on purpose. People are trying to get things to pay off. In the early days you could do it, but now the machine's not gonna pay off. They've gotten really good at not leaking money. <laughs> if there's anything casinos are good at, it's not leaking money. That's why all the lights are there and everything. But uh, uh, but it has some use in, in system testing. If you want, if you want to see absolute worst case, what can happen to your system? Maybe we'll do. I'll stop the I'll stop the stage there. That won't hurt anything. Uh, so to summarize, and then we got our little demo over here, and I'll explain what we're doing. And then afterwards, feel free to come up and poke at it yourself. <coughs> so accumulating damage from many ESD events, cables that you plug a lot, uh, uh, things that might have pulses coming down the line at you from the outside world, uh, things like that. And uh, we have these micro ESD events <coughs> that, that are the cause. And I modified that circuit to do what we're going to do over here to find a circuit board design problem. I've had, I've probably had hundreds of cases now. We're using the method that I'm going to show you that we found where the design error was in the board. Either there was a, a signal that's really way too sensitive and shouldn't be on the outside layer or there was something wrong in the layout that caused it to accept energy from the loop and caused a, a problem. And every time it was able to reproduce the same symptom, 
that that was the problem. That was the cause of the problem right there. So now, uh, I'll leave this on just in case we want to come to this. Um, you don't really have any chairs. They're not. Alice in Wonderland chairs, maybe. But Would you like a chair? Yeah, that'd be good. That way I can sit down at this table. And, uh, I'll show you the basic method here, and then I'll invite any of you who want to come up and poke at this. You're welcome to do it. Ah, thank you. Oh, well, that's a little high, but that's okay. <coughs> if you put it in the corner, I'll feel like I'm three again. <laughs> <coughs> so this is just a little thing to test out your firmware. And uh, ooh, some things are getting bent here, but I'll probably unbend them. So it's got a reset button, and let's see here. Do oh wrong, that's not it. This is it. Here's a reset button, and this sets little states. I have no idea what what these states are, but the second one makes a tone. And if I change the state, the tone stops. I know what's happening. And let me stop that for a second. This is annoying. <laughs> um, Oh, you know what? I didn't get the power cord for this thing. Hold on a second. Um, power cord and the battery. So it would be good to have both. Here's your battery, just a little USB battery. <clears throat> Before I had that little pulser, I used to use an electric fast transient generator, but they're about this big and weigh 50,000 plus $20,000. Now the question is, which of these bags has the power cord? You know you're in trouble when you're going through the airport and your bag's full of this stuff. Passes under the x-ray, and the person looking at the screen says, oh my god. <laughs> you know that it's a good thing you allowed an extra hour. <laughs> and I had that happen more than once. I'm sure it'll be the last bag in the bottom here. Yep, it is. I got sidetracked by the food. That bag weighs almost 40 pounds. So that's my weightlifting exercise, getting it into the overhead bin. And the reason I've got this little, uh, well maybe I should ask, how many people recognize this? You have to have some gray hair, or lack of it. Uh, it's an old Radio Shack radio from the 70s. An old AM radio. And I use it so I can hear when this thing's working. Um, and it's not even very good at picking up radio stations, but I don't want it to be. By the way, can everyone hear me okay? I don't need a mic or anything. So let me just turn this on. There we go. Okay. Pulses coming out of here. I'm going to slow it down. Okay, so now. <clears throat> just a 16 gauge wire loop in the BMC. Doesn't affect this experiment, but you know why I would do that? If I'm using current probes, the current probe body can capacitively couple to the wire I'm measuring. And that helps isolate. That doesn't affect this experiment. I'm just going to put it in here. So, this board has a, has a problem. It's not really a problem because this is not a product that you're going to put in something. This is just something to test your firmware on the bench. It's even got a prototype area here where that's not going to have very good RF performance. But, uh, yeah, I'm guessing it probably has, I haven't measured it recently, it was probably 30 megahertz clock or something. <clears throat> but it has a problem. If I set it going in some state, and there's some big interference in the area like ESD, it, can, it sometimes resets itself. So the question is, why is that happening? Let's just show you the side here. 
So this thing's pulsing away over here. And uh, maybe I want to slow it down a little more so I can actually see the effect. Oh. That tone is also in this radio, that's interesting. I got it pulsing pretty slow now. <clears throat> now normally you would you would scan the whole board looking for positive stuff, but I know where the problem is. It's, it's near the reset lead here. And let's see, uh, reset lead, there it is. If I get right over that path, it's, it's resetting it once per pulse. And it turns out I can put a 6 dB attenuator, another 300, it still does it, which means it's very sensitive. And uh, you don't want that. So if this were a real product, it would probably be irritating because it would reset itself in a noisy environment. And you wouldn't necessarily want that. But boy, you, you can narrow it down on a circuit board really quickly because it's a control pulse. Every pulse is about the same. And uh, I mean, I've seen, there's a Langer thing from here that has a chattering relay in it, but that's totally irreproducible. I mean, every pulse is different. And it's sort of a, just a collection of noise, basically, where this is more controlled. And uh, I think I've debugged at least 100 system problems this way over the last 10 years. And uh, very handy. If you have an EFT generator, if you MC people have an electrical fast transit generator, uh, that will do it. Uh, if you, uh, Fisher Custom Communications, the current people, if they made a thing called TGEFT a while back. They're smaller, but still. Twelve thousand dollars. The big generators are more like twenty. This is a tiny fraction of it. So uh, eventually, I, I, I transmitted by they, they, Fisher makes it. I don't really bother making things. So they make it now. Uh, but uh, anything that makes a fast rise time, slow fall time, because the DIDT of that's a single positive pulse. The fast rising edge gives you a pulse MDIDT into the circuit. But the slow edge doesn't because it's slow. You don't get much. So if I want a positive pulse to do this, negative pulse that way. And uh, anything that produces that waveform would work. If you have an EFT generator in your EMC group, then you could borrow that from them. And <coughs> that would do the job fine. You might get a hernia lifting it up and <laughs> getting it on the bench. But uh, I'll leave this thing running here. I'll turn this off temporarily for now. But I'll leave it running so afterwards you can come on up and, and, uh, and poke around with this board if you like. But any questions or discussion? So you just mentioned that um, you get a positive pulse or a negative pulse based on the orientation of your sure. loop? Sure. Uh, coming out of the center of the BNC is a positive pulse. So it's positive to negative is the drop. And that induces in the circuit the same polarity, positive and negative as a source that runs the current the other way. If I want the opposite polarity, just turn the loop around. And just, just a wire, it's a 16 gauge brass wire, fits into the BNC nicely. So it's, it's launching or it's, or it's launching? It, you know, it's from the launch end or the other right. opposite end of the launch. Yeah, any any of these faces of the loop will work when you put it down <coughs> and, and scan the board. Uh, size of the loop, I use one inch because it's sort of mostly good. Um, if you've got little tiny features, you might have to get smaller than that. Um, uh, I don't generally get any larger than an inch. Usually, usually it's just an inch. And this is just 16 gauge brass wire from the hardware store. Ace sells it. And I'm sure they all do. And I just scrape the end of the BNC, solder it straight, put the heat shrink tubing, then take plastic tweezers and bend it around and stick it in there. <clears throat> one time I did that, I was building another one for myself, and I put the soldering gun to it and it melted the BNC. Just like the solder. So I don't know if it was made out of, must have been tin or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's the real cheapies, don't get the real cheapies. But uh, there's another version of this. Um, for e-fields, uh, I would show it to you on my website, which is a new article, but it's not working because it, it wants my, I don't know why it waited half an hour to want my uh, password. But you take a BNC uh, double barrel like this, you put Kapton tape over it. By the way, do you know what Kapton tape really is? It's what holds Silicon Valley together. <laughs> Places fall apart if it weren't for the Kapton tape that get together. Uh, so you cover it with uh, Kapton tape, then you take a carpet tack whose center pin is pretty, close to a BNC pin, scrape any paint off, puncture the tape, push it on, now it's it's, lay, it's into the BNC center and it's laying on the Kapton tape. Another layer of Kapton tape and maybe heat shrink tubing to make it look nice. And that little thumbtack now would be pulsed at about a thousand volts from this. And that's a very localized E-field. You can go around and find E-field sensitivity. I find some boards have E-field sensitivities, others have H-field. Between a little loop like that and a little thumbtack thing. If you go to my website, it's the last article at the bottom of the page. It's always the last one at the bottom. 
you'll see the description of how to make that thing. And it's a very localized little e-field, so it's interesting to find those sensitivities on board. Uh, and both can cause problems. And I, I've had some boards where some parts were, e some paths were e-field sensitive that shouldn't have been. I mean, you shouldn't be able to cause problems at this level on a board if it's well designed. So what's, what's the problem with that particular board? Oh, what's that? that problem? Oh, the problem is, oh, what's the problem? On the back, this is a two-layer board, but the back side's ground. And underneath that, that processor chip, uh, there's a patch of power in the middle of the chip. And a little leg of it comes out and makes a red angle bend. When it does that, it, the reset lead crosses that break in the plane. And that increases sensitivity a lot to this. If it didn't do that, it might not be so sensitive. And certainly if there were a plane five, millimeter, five mils underneath, the signal wouldn't do it. So it's losing its reference plane. It's losing its reference plane. And that increases the and loop. And that forms a loop. And, and that increases that, the inductive loop and that and it picks up any stuff change in the inductive loop is right. is going to change the signal, right? Right. And that becomes the secondary winding of this primary of a transformer. Right. The, the trouble is in, in the in, out in the world, there's lots of stuff that couples in the loop. And if it happens to be a fast signal, it'll, <coughs> it'll radiate like crazy too. Wireless people make antennas by crossing a little path across a break of a certain size one way to make wireless antenna. But, right, so uh, I didn't know I didn't know that was the cause of it, right? But sort of the demo that Rob showed, right? Where he showed it as how kind of this kind of The impedance went uh, high and that was because it was a little void. Would have caught something like that, right? Yeah. This had a, would have a good chance of interrupting causing a, a problem with that signal and you might be able to observe that as a function. So 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 this is a way of finding at least on the surface, uh, board layout defects uh, that uh, uh, maybe if you don't have a program like that, or maybe you weren't paying attention when you were doing it. And now, just because you have a loop doesn't mean you will have a problem. You just have some energy to get into it. But boy, ESD loves to do that. And uh, 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 for instance, here's an example of that. It was a, a networking company in England. They made a uh, router of some kind. And when they zap it during compliance testing, it would make too many bit errors. So I was talking to him over the phone for a few days, and I told him about this test. They had an EFT generator, so they made a loop, and they're around. And they find a little area of the board that gave them the same symptom. And I said, okay, not, not being able to see the board at that point, I said, uh, not as a fix, but as a test, just cover that area with the copper tape and ground it several places on the other side. Tell me if that fixes the problem or not. Turns out it did. So something there is a the problem. They looked at the layout, there's nothing wrong with the layout in that area, but the only other thing there was the clock generating chip. And then they had this great idea, they just put a different brand of chip in, and it fixed it. The brand they were using was just sensitive to the, this is a very nice metal case, it's surprising, I don't think much field was getting in from the ESD, but enough to jitter the clock on that one brand of chip and not the other. But changing the brand of clock oscillator to fix an ESD problem is the last thing anyone would ever think, including me, of doing. But it sort of honed right in on that, that that was the sensitive thing that produced the symptom. And uh, total lab time to get to that point was probably maybe two hours on their part. It was very quick. And they're very happy, just change the manufacturer of the chip and then go on. But, uh, so a very handy test. And uh, how many of you have an EMC department? Just to be okay, they probably have an EFT generator, you could probably use it for this. By the way, those are the people you don't want to attract the attention of. It spoils your whole day, right at the end, you're about to bark and then all of a sudden everything grinds to a halt, the CEO wants to know why, because some little blip on an analyzer somewhere causes a problem and everything grinds to a halt. But uh, it used to be annoying for me because that was like the weekends at work, you know, trying to get my design to work. A couple other quickie things here. Uh, is everyone here a hardware designer? Do you have any software people? No software? Oh, good. <laughs> That's the dark side. <laughs> what's, what's the first thing you do when you have a hardware design problem on your prototype? Blame the software. Blame the software. The trouble is they have a high reflection coefficient. <laughs> because they outnumber us in most companies. <coughs> you blame us over, they say, I'd prove it now. Once in my lifetime I was able to prove it, uh, but uh, only once in all, I'm 72 now, I've been in the field since rough. I knew at age 10 I was gonna be electrical engineer. If I 14, I probably would have considered one, but <laughs> college was something of a formality. But, uh, the, uh, uh, my first designs for myself were vacuum tubes. No one was giving away transistors in 1960. 
1958. So I designed circuits for myself, my own use, and vacuum tubes. I still, my, my, my brain is cluttered with unusable information like the pinouts and voltage and current ratings of a 12AU7 dual triode, 6146 beam power pinto, and things like that. I wish I could reformat parts of my brain and reuse it for something useful. You know. but, uh, anyway, so uh, uh, if someone wants to come up and fiddle this, they'll turn this thing back on. You can poke around and uh, uh, see if you can find the problem. Doug, can you talk to like, some of the ways you'd mitigate a problem like that? Uh, in this case, uh, I would do what I would call digilog design. At this point, I've already got a board, right? And if we're getting close to setup, we can't make a big change, right? Uh, so anytime you have a reset lead, or maybe any edge triggered lead, and reset, like this is a, this is a debounce button, it's a slow signal, right? ESD is, at least the fast part of ESD is over in about 20 nanoseconds, and all of it's over in 100. I'll put like a one microsecond time constant. Right at the pin, a little capacitor to ground. In fact, I would always do this in any design. If you have a reset signal, put in the layout, a capacitor to ground, we're not gonna put it there to start with, and a series resistance, put a zero in there for now. Or just leave the pad shorted, because we might not need it. In the lab, you could cut it off, put a resistor until the layout people, unshort that resistor and put something there. Uh, maybe 50 ohms, you can usually tolerate that. And then uh, whatever capacitance to ground gives me maybe a one microsecond time constant, a couple microsecond time constants. For this, you could probably even do a millisecond. Uh, the most dangerous thing I've seen is when people take an edge trigger that can reset and run it all over the place. I even had one company take the raw processor reset lead and run it from the processor board to a board full of electromechanical relays on a flat cable that had about 20 conductors. Of the reset lead was roughly in the middle and had two ground leads on the outside, separated that far from the reset lead. I'm guessing it didn't work very well. No, that's why I was there. <laughs> Uh, never ever, you know, at the very least buffer the thing, right? So you can't backfeed into the processor. You get half a reset pulse. By the way, that was an interesting problem. The problem with the device was, I see interesting stuff. And some of these are funny if it wasn't your problem or if it's been long enough time since you were fired. <laughs> but there, it was a parking machine. So you pull up in the parking lot and you put your money, you get a little tag, a little ticket you take with you or put on your car. And the problem was, at the end of the day, the maintenance person comes and takes the change box out and puts an empty one in, slams the door, and walks away. Nothing happens for a minute. Um, starting a minute later, the machine prints out a ticket of random characters every minute, once a minute, and spits it out on the ground. <laughs> person comes back the next day, there's a pile of funny looking tickets on the ground, no one put any money in the machine. <laughs> that was an interesting problem. And uh, the actual fix, that, although that was not a good design issue, that and that may have contributed. That wasn't the only source of the problem. The problem was actually fixed by, they had six mounting screws on the board, and they had isolated it from the chassis. And I took a Dremel tool and ground down to the first ground plane on all of them, covered it with solder, put glues back in, and that fixed it. Grounding the board to the, as many places as possible. Okay. That's, that's fixed ESD problems at least 100 times for me. Um, the, uh, if you single point ground the board, that's the worst case, because that's the noisiest spot. <coughs> Because you get a parallel plate capacitor, a little induction, you just hit one end, of the, one side of the capacitor with a ESD mount. But since we know the single point grounding is quiet, that's where you put the phase lock loop, and then it gets jittered every time. But, uh, <clears throat> lots of interesting problems. That example I gave earlier of the missing capacitor, so it was a big uh, uh, router-like thing, and they'd been through all the compliance testing. It was fine, ESD, you get everything, uh, but in the field. They come up, we're having this installation in, in Spain that's, it's, the power over ethernet ports are locking up, which means you gotta cycle the machine and recycle out everything. And uh, this is it just that one location? Yep, right, as far as we know, it's that one location. So I'm thinking, you know, like there's an elevator motor right next to the thing or something. Within two days, it's happening all over Europe. <laughs> And uh, I begin to think of, you know, vacation in Malta, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, using this method, we found the problem. And the problem was mitigated. There was a spot for a capacitor in the palm, both to this test, even though it passed the FT test, and in the field was fixed by a capacitor in the, in the place where there was one, a spot for one, but they didn't put one there. Someone forgot, I guess. And it fixed the problem. This, this narrowed it down, and then we looked at it, oh yeah, there's a missing capacitor. Let's try it, you know, and it worked. 
But then again, there's like a year's production of the field. So if there happen to be a noisy location, they're going to have this problem. Most locations aren't noisy, but you never know. And uh, again, that's why I get the fun part. Finding the problem is, all these problems are uh, both signal integrity, MC, all this stuff, ESD. It's all incredibly a, a lot of fun. It's like, like a, uh, um, who's that famous detective anyway? Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. It's like a Sherlock Holmes. The only trouble is it's, it, it's an emergency when it happens. That's what spoils the fun. If it for that, it would actually be fun. We get to work on all these things. But uh, uh, any other questions or thoughts, or have you run into anything like this? No. No, By the way, I, sh I should say one thing, just to be totally transparent. So I did that design, I transferred it onto Fisher. They make it now. If, if you buy one, I'll get to take my wife to dinner. <laughs> but uh, you don't have, there's other generators, like the EFT generator will do the same thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I'll get the opportunity to come up and check out his uh, Yeah, I've got it going here. So, yeah, let's you can poke away. Just a couple quick uh, notes. Uh, our next meeting will be July 24th, 25th, Thursday, and we're going to be hosted by Amazon Lab 126. So thank you very much to the guys over there, Umar. What day? Uh, July 25th. And Altium will be the sponsor. And in October, our meeting will be sponsored and hosted by Zukin. So we've got all four big uh, EDAs this year. Once again, I want to again thank Cadence for hosting us today, especially uh, Cameron. I guess he stepped out. But a uh, big round of applause for C Cadence again. Thank you very much. And uh, as always, we need speakers, topic ideas, and speakers. So if anybody can recommend somebody or reach out to somebody and let me know. Uh, we need one for October and for July, so please help me out if you can. Any comments, questions from anybody? I so might be able to do something like that. I have a zillion topics. All those articles, I could turn any one of them into a talk. Very well. If you ever need a fill-in. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> so I wanted to ask, huh? why two watches? I was waiting for that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, this you used to be a heart rate monitor watch when I run. Oh, okay. But now it's Bluetooth to the iPhone. I don't have watches for the past day. But what I found was two watches are 10 times more accurate than one. This watch loses a quarter of a second a day. That loses half a second. So I set this one two seconds fast, that one four seconds. When they cross, it's time to reset them again. Oh, wow. And you know why you want to do that? Why do you need to set time closest to a fraction of a second? How often do you fly Southwest Airlines? I don't. You want to check in three, 750 milliseconds after the 24 hour to get the best seat. Oh, really? <laughs> if you wait five seconds, someone else has got it. I thought maybe it was Arizona and Nevada. <laughs> well, that's confusing because they don't go on daylight time in Nevada. Right. Though, so half the year it's the same time, right. the other half right. the year is different by an hour. Right. <laughs> and what's the 2.7? Oh, oh, I actually meant to ask it. Does anyone know what this is? 2.718281828495059. E. Face of natural logarithm. Oh, okay. E to the J omega T. Now what an energy character. <laughs> Everyone has a Pi t shirt. No one has this. That's my guy. Right. I walk around Boulder State. They're not technical people. Though. They look at this and I look really straight. Give me this question mark. Well, thank you again for showing okay. up. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, we've got, uh, His, uh, his experiment uh, or do some networking uh, but thank you very much for showing up and today.